All right, here we go. So uh, next chunk of this uh, chapter on work and energy, we're really going to focus on the basics of work and on, this is new because we did not talk about this last year, something called the dot product, okay? So there's definitely new stuff here, okay? So um, here we go. So hopefully you remember from last year that when you, when you do work, oops, when you do work on an object, you have to be changing the energy in some way, all right? So um, a little bit later in the chapter, we're going to get into the specifics of how the work changes the energy. Okay, we'll get into that later. For now, what I really want to focus on is uh, not how the work changes the energy, but how the work is done. Okay, what has to be true about a force in order for that force to do work on the object? All right. So a couple of reminders about work. So first of all, we're going to use capital letter W to represent work. Um, Remember that, uh, like I just said, when you do work on an object, or when a force does work on an object, it changes the energy in some way, all right? It means it's going to change at least one part of this equation here. You're going to either change your GPE, your KE, your EPE, or your TE, all right? Um, and in order for that to happen, in order for your energy to change in some way, in order for work to be done, there has to be a force doing the work, all right? But the issue is that not every force does work, okay? So in order for a force to do work on an object, two things have to be true. Number one, the object has to be moving, all right? If the object is not moving, you cannot do work on it, okay? Uh, secondly, the direction that the force is exerted in cannot be perpendicular to the direction of the motion. In other words, the force has to have at least one component that's parallel to the displacement, okay? Or vice versa. Um, that is, it, it amounts to the same thing, as we'll see, okay? All right, um, All right. a couple other quick things. Um, so, the work is negative if the force is working against the motion, all right? The work being done by a force is always negative if the force is working against the motion. So, if the object is moving this way and the force is this way, this force will do negative work on the object, okay? Um, all right, now, um, later on in the chapter, this next chunk will get more important, but I'm going to bring it up now just to kind of plan it in your brain here. So there are two types of force. There are conservative forces and non-conservative forces, okay? Um, I don't think we're going to get into that too much this video, but just to remind you, um, so if a conservative force does work, then it's just converting energy to or from potential energy. You're not actually changing the total energy, hence the word conservative. Um, you're just converting potential energy to some other form of energy, okay, or vice versa, all right? Um, when a non-conservative force does work, then you are changing the total energy. You're either adding energy into the system or taking energy away from the system, okay? All right, so, um, and in general, remember that positive work usually means you're gaining energy, and negative work means you're uh, decreasing energy, okay? All right, so, moving on. All right, so to calculate the work, so we learned this equation last year, um, but there's an important caveat that I need to put on it this year. All right, so to find the work done by a constant force, uh, you are going to find what's called the dot product of the force and the distance, okay? So the equation that's in most books is this. To calculate the work, you multiply the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement and multiply it by the cosine of the angle between those two forces. I'm sorry, between those two vectors, okay? So if your displacement is this way, uh, incidentally, we're using D for displacement now. There you go. <laughs> All right, so if your displacement is this way and your force is this way, to calculate the work done by that force, it's the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them, okay? Notice, in order to use this equation, it must be true that your force is constant and your angle is constant, okay? If either of those things are changing, then uh, you got to do some calculus, all right? So, um, so here we got a couple examples. So uh, in this drawing down here, we've got this little bead, okay, and it's being pulled by a force off this way, right? Okay, and the idea is that force has two components. 
there's a perpendicular component which doesn't directly affect the horizontal motion of the object and therefore it doesn't do work, okay? So it's only the horizontal component of the force that's actually going to do work, okay? That's where this cosine of theta comes from, right? Because the horizontal component of F would just be F times the cosine of this angle here, right? Okay? So it is always the component of the force that is parallel to your displacement that does the work, Okay, um, and so the idea, this little graphic here is meant to show you this, that if you start out with a small amount of kinetic energy and you're already moving forwards and your force is contributing to that velocity, the object is going to speed up, you're doing work, you're increasing kinetic energy and therefore doing positive work. All right, it is worth noting though that your work can be negative, right? If in this example the object had been moving to the left, then the force would be working against that, and you'd be decreasing your kinetic energy, and thus your work would be negative. Okay? All right, so this is all speaking in very general terms. Uh, I think it's probably easier to do some examples. So the first couple examples I'm going to do here, if I recall correctly, yes, uh, are going to be pretty basic. Um, but I think important, all right? So, so bear with me, all right? So example number one, Roy pushes a box to the right, on a horizontal surface with a force of 40 newtons while it slides to the right three meters. So the idea is we've got this horizontal surface, we've got a box, it is sliding to the right, it is going to undergo a displacement of three meters. Now notice there could be all kinds of forces on this thing. There might be friction, maybe Sally's pushing on it. Um, the only thing that we know is that Roy is pushing it to the right with 40 newtons, and as a result, the only thing we can do is find the work that Roy does, okay? So, all right, so to do that, to calculate work, we gotta use our equation. So work is, by definition, force dot displacement, which we still haven't talked about what this means, we'll get to that in a minute, all right? Um, but for now, the way that we've learned to calculate it is this, you take the force, you, the magnitude of the force, you multiply it by the magnitude of the displacement and multiply it by the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. Okay, so for us, um, our work is the magnitude of the force, 40 newtons, times the magnitude of the displacement, 3 meters, times the cosine of, well, our force is this way, our displacement is this way, the angle between those is zero, the cosine of zero is one, so we basically end up with 120 joules of work, okay? Remember, Newton meters is joules, okay? So that's that. Um, now, I'll be honest, I, when you've got a scenario like this where your force and your displacement are parallel, I just remember that it's just force times distance, okay? Um, and in fact, the next example is going to show us what happens if they're anti-parallel, if the force and the displacement are exactly working against each other, okay? So here we go, example number two. Roy pushes a box to the right while it slides to the left. So it's the exact same example, but this time our displacement vector points this way, okay? But Roy is still pushing to the right. So we calculate the work. It's force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. So the idea is here's my force vector, here's my displacement vector. The angle between them is 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 is negative 1, right? So you get 40 times 3 times negative 1, which gives you negative 120 joules, right? So, I mean, I guess what I always just remember is that as long as you're working on a, on a um, on one axis, you can just do work equals force times displacement and just keep track of your signs, right? In other words, for us, the force was to the right, so that's 40 newtons. The displacement's to the left, so that's negative 3 meters. Multiply it and you get negative 120 joules. Okay? But that only works if you're working on one axis, okay? On a linear, you know, in a linear situation. Okay? 
All right. So that is that. Um, and hopefully this is a little bit intuitive, right? The idea is the, the box is moving to the left, and the force is working against that. So you're doing negative work because you're going to lose energy. All right. Now, in example three, kind of the same idea. We've got a five kilogram box, so mer, 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 five kilograms. It's sliding to the right three meters. So let's put in our displacement vector, three meters. Uh, on a horizontal surface, find the work the normal force does. Um, so the normal force, well, let's see. To find our normal force, we've got to talk about gravity, right? So our force of gravity, 5 times 9.8, so negative 49 newtons. Assuming there are no other forces, which doesn't describe any, that means our normal force has to be positive 49 newtons. And the idea is this vertical force here is going to do nothing to affect the displacement, right? It's going to just keep moving at a constant velocity. So you're not going to gain or lose energy as a result of this force. All right? Mathematically, it looks like this. Work is the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. So the work done by the normal force is the magnitude of the normal force, blah, 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 blah. Um, so let's see. The force, normal force is 49 newtons. The displacement is 3 meters times the cosine of, what do we got? Well, let's see. Our displacement is this way. Our vert, uh, normal force is this way. That is a right angle. And thus, we want 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is 0. And you get 0. OK? So this brings us back to this idea that the only way that work can do, sorry, a force can do work is if The direction of the force is not perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that was what happened there with that normal force. OK? So now what happens? So we've done 0 degrees. We've done 90 degrees. We've done 180 degrees. What if our force is not a multiple of 90? So we will get to that after I discuss this slide, which I forgot about. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. So. Uh, if multiple forces do work, then the net work on an object, oops, the net work on an object, or the total work on an object, is equal to the work done by the net force. All right? I'm going to usually use this symbol, net work, to represent the net work. Just a silly sentence. Uh, occasionally, you'll see this, work net. Uh, so if I write that, it means the same thing. All right? Um, and then work done by an individual force is indicated with the subscript. So long story short, there are two ways you can calculate the network. You can either, um, to calculate your network, you can find the work done by each of the individual forces and add those up. So find the work done by Roy, and the work done by the normal force, and the work done by friction, and the work done by Sally, and add those up to get your total work. Or you can find your net force and you know, find the work done by the net force. Okay. Um, and depending on the scenario, you know, there are uh, different circumstances under which each are useful, okay? Which is part of what makes AP physics hard, right? It's figuring out which way to do this. All right, so what if the angle is weird? I don't know why I have this slide here. We'll talk about that more later on. Um, all right, so 50 kilogram box of donuts sits at rest on a warehouse floor. Roy pushes the box using a force of 400 newtons at 30 degrees below the horizontal. If he pushes the box 6 meters and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.25 then, and you got to find out how much work he did, how much work friction did, how much work the normal force did, blah, 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 blah. So we probably want to take a second and make a free body diagram. All right? So I guess the first thing we should do is deal with this 30 degrees below the horizontal, or 400 newtons, right? So here's our force of Roy, 400 newtons. Oh, I guess I can just do this. It's at 30 degrees below the horizontal. So here's Roy's horizontal component. Here's his vertical component. Trigonometry. That was the worst sentence ever. Trigonometry, this. And you'll discover that the x component is 346.4 newtons. The y component's negative 200 newtons. Okay? So now let's go make our free body diagram. So here we go 50 kilograms. Gravity is going to be negative 490. Roy's vertical force is negative 200. 
This horizontal force is the 346.4. There's got to be a normal force, which is embiggened by this. So we're going to end up with 690, right? To cancel out both Roy's force and gravity. So now I can multiply by my coefficient of kinetic friction to find my force of kinetic friction. And it turns out to be negative 172.5. Newtons. All right, so there's our free body diagram. All right, so let's uh, answer the question. So part A says, how much force, how much work did Roy do? All right, so I really want you guys to understand two different ways of solving question A. All right, so option one is to just straight out use the equation. The work that Roy did is equal to the force of Roy times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between those two. So the force of Roy is 400 newtons. The displacement was 6 meters. I guess I should have drawn that over here. D equals 6 meters, right? Because it's sliding along the horizontal surface. 6 meters times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, so the idea is, um, let's see how do we so Roy's force is this way, the displacement is horizontal, so the angle between those is this 30 degrees here. So this is times the cosine of 30 degrees. And you get an answer of 2,078.5 joules. All right? So that works, 100% that works. The other way of thinking about it, and for whatever reason, even though this is often more work, I, I don't know, I guess it depends on the problem. So look, Roy's force has two components to it, right? There's the horizontal component and the vertical component. Only one of those two components is actually doing work because only one of them is in the direction of the displacement. So do this. The work done by Roy is equal to the force of Roy in the x direction. Do you know what? Let me write it this way. It's the force of Roy in the direction of, oops. It's the force of Roy in the direction of the displacement. Okay, so this little d is indicating it's the component of Roy's force that lies along the displacement vector. And here our displacement vector is along the x-axis. So times the displacement. Okay, so the force of Roy in the direction of the displacement is 346 times our displacement. And it gives you basically the same answer. It works. It's a little bit different just because of rounding. But if you didn't round, you'd get exactly the same answer. OK? There is value in understanding this. OK? You need to be thinking about the component of your force that is parallel to your displacement. Or, weirdly, if you wanted to, you could actually do this. You could find I'm going to regret getting into this here. You could find, so our force is this way, right? If you wanted to, you could find the component of the displacement that's parallel to that force. <laughs> and it actually ends up giving you the same thing, because this is 30 degrees. This is 6 meters, so whatever this displacement is in the direction of the force times 400 gives you this same work. Okay? So you got to make sure that these two vectors, your force and your displacement, that you look at parallel components of those forces, or of those vectors. Okay? All right, let's see. Part B, how much work did friction do? That one's a little bit more straightforward, right? Because the... Uh, force of friction and the displacement are in opposite directions. So the work done by friction is just, well, the force of friction is to the left, so I'm just going to call that negative 172.5 newtons. The displacement is to the right, I'm going to call that positive 6 meters. Multiply that and you get negative 1,035 newtons. All right. If this is weirding you out, the way that I did it, you could also do this. The work done by friction is the force of friction magnitude times displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. Since your displacement is this way and your force is this way, the angle is 180 degrees. And that cosine of 180 degrees gives us that negative sign. Okay? 
All right, great. So up until now, we, we've solved a bunch of these, but we haven't really talked about what a dot product is. Um, and I've sort of alluded to it. It's, so the idea is we've got these two vectors, right? Force and displacement, okay? Force and displacement are vectors. So force dot displacement. So the dot product is kind of conceptually, it's a measure of how much one of these vectors helps the other one, okay? And so the idea is that, you know, when your displacement is this way and your force is this way, they're not helping each other at all, right? When your displacement is this way and your force is this way, there's a tiny little part, so here's my force, right? The only part of that force that's actually helping the displacement is this, right? And so that's what the dot product is, is it's the product of the component of one vector in the direction of the other times the other vector. There's no easier way to say that, okay? So, let's erase that. Um, yeah. So, it turns out, though, that there are two different ways that you can calculate the dot product, all right? And so I want to walk you through that. So the first way is what we've been doing, FD cosine theta, okay? And honestly, for the AP test, that's probably the only way you're ever going to have to do it. And if you, you know, place out of a first year uh, physics course and get dropped into a second one, you're going to have to know how to do the second way. So I'm going to walk you through it. All right, so check it out. So here we go. We've got a box sliding across a frictionless floor. All right, a force of 3i minus 8j newtons acts on the box as the box goes through a displacement of negative 4i plus 2j meters. We're going to find the work done on the box. All right, so let's draw each of these vectors, okay? So my force vector, oops, I want that to be green, so I'm going to go back. So my force vector is this. Oh, darn it. <laughs> Sorry, my force vector is this. It's 3i minus 8j. So here's my force. All right, so if you go through and do your trigonometry, you can find your hypotenuse and discover that it's 8.54 newtons. And if you do the math, you can figure out that this angle here is 69.4 degrees. Okay? Similarly, we can focus on our displacement vector, which is this. So the displacement vector is negative 4i plus 2j to get the displacement. So do your, trig or your uh, Pythagorean theorem. The displacement turns out to be 4.47 meters at an angle of 26.6 degrees that way. All right. So now, um, if I want to find the work done by that, then the work is force times displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. So let's see. Let's draw ourselves a little coordinate system. So my force is this way. So this angle is 69.4 degrees. My displacement is this way. So this angle here is 26.6 degrees. Uh, you probably want to pick the angle that is less than 180 degrees. I don't think that it actually matters. Uh, in fact, I know it doesn't matter. Um, but so I am going to find this angle here and call that theta. Okay, so well, let's see. I know this is 26. I know this is 90. And I know that I am out of, oh, I think he's red, yes. I know that this angle is 90 minus 69.4, which is, uh, why am I, 20.6 newtons, right? Or 20.6 degrees, sorry. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So that means that, that total theta, when you solve it, it's 20.6 plus 26.6 plus 90, and it gives you uh, 137.2 degrees. So my work then is my force, which is 8.54 newtons, times my displacement, 4.47 meters, times the cosine of 137.2 degrees, 
plug that into your calculator and you get negative 28 joules. Okay, it's like 28.02 or something like that. Okay, so there's our answer. That is how much work was done by the box in this problem. Holy cow, that was a pain. So it turns out that when you know the components of your vector, vectors, there is a super secret ninja trick that you can use to calculate the work. Okay? So suppose you're given two vectors. This is this is math. This is no longer physics for a quick second. Alright? So suppose I've got vector A. Alright? And vector A is the following. It's AX in the I direction plus AY in the J direction. Okay? And I've got vector B, which is BX in the I direction plus by in the j direction. Okay? So, to find the dot product, option one is to do what we've been doing. Magnitude of a, magnitude of b, times the cosine of the angle between them. It turns out, for reasons that you will learn at some point in your mathematics career, the other way that you can find the dot product is this. Multiply your x components, Multiply your y components and add them up. Okay. So this, I'll, I'll do it in a minute and prove to you that it works. This illustrates clearly the fact that when you take a dot product, you're sort of multiplying two vectors and you're getting a scalar. All right. And for that reason, sometimes this dot product is called a scalar product. All right. It turns out there are two ways you can multiply two vectors. You can either use what's called a dot product, which is what we're doing now. It results in a scalar. There's also what's called a cross product, which we'll use when we get to torque, uh, which results in a vector. Okay. So anyway, long story short, dot product is also called a scalar product. It gives you a scalar, which means to us that work does not have direction. Okay. All right. So. Um, Let's try that problem again using our new knowledge. Oh no, where did it go? My solution two slide has disappeared. All right, well, here we go. We're going to go back to this. So let's get rid of this slide. Bear with me. I want to keep this slide. So here we go. Okay, so here we go. Solution two. All right, so we want to find the work being done, right? So the work done by our force is force dot displacement, okay? So that's our horizontal force times our horizontal displacement plus our vertical force times our vertical displacement. And that's, let's see, our horizontal and vertical forces are 3i and 8j. So I want 3 for my fx and negative 8 for my Fy, and then my displacement, the x is negative 4, and the y is positive 2, and then add them up. So let's see, 3 times negative 4 is negative 12, plus negative 8 times 2 is negative 16, negative 12, Plus negative 6 is negative 28 joules. I am the happiest dude alive. All right. So there we go. How are we doing on time? That's uh, not bad. Half an hour. All right. Um, I guess that's it. I think anything else I do would just be another example of something we're already done. We've already done. So there you go. Work and how to calculate it dot product. Remember, the work is a scalar calculated by doing force dot displacement. I apologize for the change in notation on displacement. I'm really wishing I'd used delta R, but I didn't. Goodbye.